woman, thy husband suffers. See, what a powerful line. And he is addressing to Savitri a woman. There is great dignity in that. Like, uh, like uh, Shampakla, he is such a crying. Yeah. The yeah. So Softly it lay as often before his sleep and waste the signal motionlessly swift. So this is the uh, oxymoron, you see. <laughs> we have seen another oxymoron here. She knew not. Yes, she has relaxed her grasp. She knows that Satyavan is suffering. She would not like him to suffer. But what to do? At the moment, she does not know. She knew not to what goes her spirit above on the crypt summit of a secret form, like one lifts sentinel on a mountain crest. So now, actually, the crypt is in the basement of the church, in the cathedral, normally. But here it is on the summit. Her real self is about there, sleeping or whatever it is up there, you see. She knew not what goes her spirit above on the crypt summit of a secret form. That is her secret form is there, you see. Like one left sentinel on a mountain peak. A fiery footed splendor, fusant wing, watched waving silent with a voiceless soul, like a still sail upon a windless sea. So from above, the whole thing is being watched. A fiery footed splendor, it is that from above who is watching the whole thing here. Fusant wing, watched flaming silent with her voiceless soul. Her stands here in this context of splendor. Voiceless soul, like a still sail upon a windless sea. Like a still sail upon a windless sea. Now this is what we have seen last time in Coldridge's ancient mariner. Like a painted ship on a painted ocean. Like a painted ship on a painted ocean. The boat stood there without any movement. There was no wind, nothing. Like a painted ship on a painted ocean. So we have got a picture and the ship is there. Still always like that, you see. It's not more. In that manner. So this is a direct echo of Polridge's line. Like a painted ship on a painted ocean. Like a still sail, sail ship, windless sea, painted ocean, you see. So as I told you, Shevendu draws all those allusions from his rich knowledge of English poetry and English literature, you see. <laughs> A fiery foot is splendor, pure and wing, was flaming silent with his voiceless soul. Like a still sail upon a windless sea. White, passionless, it rode and anchored might. So she's firm in that calmness, waiting for far red impulse should arise out of the eternal depth and cast its surge. So she's now waiting what to do. She has no knowledge what to do here, but she's waiting for some kind of inspiration, some kind of surge to come and take her forward. White, passionless, it wrote. An anchored might, it is firm, fixed also. Waiting what far reached impulse, what is coming from beyond Prari, out of the eternal depths and cast its surge. So Savitri is waiting there, but in the meanwhile, then death, the king leaned boundless down as lanes, night over tired land. When evening pales and fading gleams break down the horizon's wall, nor yet the dusk grows mystic with a moon. What a poetic description, you see. Now, Yama, death is leaning down, leaning down, boundless down. He is, you know, bound by. As leans night, the way the night leans over the evening sky, over the evening landscape. Tired lands, they had done the day's full work, 
and the evening is leaning down. Evening pale and fading gleams break down the horizon's wall. So on the horizon you see different kind of colors of the evening twilight. They see. Now yet the dusk grows misty. At the moment the dusk is still there, but it has not grown mystic enough. So the moon, the mystic moon is not yet there in the sky. The transition twilight region is there. See. And then death, the king, you see he is a king, he is a master. He is the law, he is a sovereign. Lean boundless down as lean might over tired lands when even See, this is a beautiful simile, very rare kind of a simile and description, you see. The dim and awful godhead rose erect. So he is again, we have seen dreadful, earlier dreadful god, now he is a dim and awful god, you see. Rose erect, so he is now rising above. How? Why he is rising above? Because from his brief stooping to his touch on a, he has stooped down and now is standing erect. What for he did the stoop down? To pick up the spirit of such a one. Stoop down for that, you see. From his brief stooping to his touch on earth, and like a dream that wakes out of a dream. So you are seeing the dream waking out in a dream, you see. Forsaking the poor mold of the dead clay. So he is now giving up his body, dead body, dead clay. Another luminous Satyavan arose, starting upright from the recumbent earth, as if someone over viewless borders stepped, emerging on the edge of unseen world. Now, this is the description of Satyavan. And how is coming out from the body? The whole life was as if a dream, and out of that dream is became only a dream. You see, you are waking in a dream. You see, you are dreaming that in a dream you are waking. You see, <laughs> from his brief stooping to his touch on earth, and like a dream that wakes out of a dream, forsaking the poor mold. So he has given up now the body completely. That leaves. another luminous Satyavan arose. The most awful line. It cannot be poetized. It is a real experience. Only the yogi, the occultist, can have vision to see that. You may say, So, what is a great thing death has done? This luminous Satyavan was until now hidden from sight. He is a person, but behind that person there is somebody very luminous that is not seen. That what was covering him up, that is removed by whom? By death. And what do you see now? Only that luminous person here. So we are here, there is something very luminous in us, but we don't see that thing. When this goes away, then that luminous can come out, you see. Then only that luminous can come out. Another luminous Satyavan rose. So until now he was there because Savitri was holding him back in her clasp. He was unable to come out. Therefore, this king he stoops down. You see, you imagine the king is stooping down, no? <laughs> the king is leaning down, you see. <laughs> that is a kind of a beautiful contrast, beautiful kind of an oxymoron. A king Stooping, you see, leaning. <coughs> because he has looked down, he, his interest is not in the body and all that. His interest is this true spirit of the person. It is that he would like to Something hold him. Boundless. Boundless. boundless down. He is not bound by lean, boundless. He is not bound by anything. Vast. Boundless is without any boundary. As lays night, night has no bounds, no boundaries. Nor yet the dusk grows mystic with the moon. See, the dusk, the twilight has not yet become mystic because there is no moon yet. Is the twilight, you see. The den and awful god had rose erect from his brief stooping 
You see, he's stooping down. The king is stooping down to his touch on earth and like a dream that wakes out of a dream. Forsaking the poor mold of the dead clay, another luminous Satyavan arose. Now, about this luminous Satyavan, starting up right from the recumbent earth, as if someone over viewless borders stepped emerging on the edge of unseen worlds. He is emerging now on the worlds which are not visible. See. Now, only a great occultist and a yogi can give the description. We have two instances of the luminous person being seen after death in the Ramayana. In the Ramayana. Ramayana. Valmiki is Ramayana. Very vivid, very clear, very beautiful descriptions. The first one is of Rishi Sharvanga. He was the person who had performed the Yajna in the house of Dasharatha where Rama was born. Now he has grown old, Sharabhanga, and he is in his hermitage, in the ashrama, in the forest and all that, with all the disciples all around. And he has to go, ascend to heaven, to Swarga. So, it is Indra, the lord of heaven, he himself sends a chariot, golden, beautiful, chariot with white horses to give a ride to Sharabhanga and take him to heaven. <laughs> the chariot has come down and that is what Rama is pointing out to Lakshmana, his brother. And of course his wife Sita, they are all there together at that time. So he is pointing out, see, Indra chariot has come to take away Sharabhanga to heaven. Very beautiful, very rare kind of a thing. God sending a chariot for the receipt to take to heaven. A great honor, a great privilege, great fruit of tapasya, what you want to call it. But Sharabhanga says, I am sorry, I am not going to take your chariot. I will not avail your chariot at all to go to heaven. Why? Because I know that Rama is here around and shortly he is going to visit me. He is going to visit me here in the ashram. I am not going to take your chariot now and go away. Then Rama comes there and when they meet, etc., etc., then he leaves his body. Sharvanga, he leaves his body of his own record. And the body is put on the firewood. The fire is burning bright and out of the fire arises a luminous Sarvanga. Out of the fire. Because the fire was lit by Rama himself. And when he is dead, now he sees a luminous Sarvanga rising from the fire and he goes away, you see. For him now finished, you see. And by that he crosses the words of Indra heaven. He crosses the worlds where the great rishis go and live after they pass away from here. He goes straight to Brahma Loka, the highest station to go and decide the Brahma Loka, the house of the eternal. He goes and lives there eternally, Saravanga. So, what has happened here is after death, then you really see the Luminous Sharavanga. Until then, you see all the physical, gross physical, and that kind of a thing you see. Here, a luminous Satyavan arose without being put on the fire. You see, <laughs> there is <coughs> another story also 
of uh, in the Ramayana itself of Shabari. Shabari was a elderly, very old lady. She was staying in the ashram of Matanga Rishis in the south near Hampi. And Rama and Lakshmana, they were going from place to place in search of abducted Sita. They come to Hampi, Pampa Sarovar, and Matanga Rishis, they had become very old. They had left the ashram and gone to heaven. But they had prepared garlands of flowers which never decay. Never. Decay. They never decay. They remain always fresh and fragrant. So they had prepared the garland and they had told Shabari, when Rama comes here, please offer these garlands to him. You see. Shabari of course receives them, uh, Rama and Lakshmana, and she hosts them, whatever fruits are there, etc. etc. She gives to Rama and then uses the garlands also to him, offers them. And then she tells Rama, Look, I wanted to go away along with those rishis, but they had told me to stay back here and host Rama here in the forest, offer him all that is required for him to be. And when he comes here and when you have served him, then you leave the body. She was told like that. And now she tells Rama, look, now the time has come for me to leave the body. She is ready to leave the body. So the fire is lit and she is now ready to jump into the fire. She had jumped into the fire and all that was earthly, etc., etc., completely has disappeared and pure and luminous shabari arises from the burning fire. Luminous shabari arising from that burning fire, you see. So here we have got now a luminous satyavan arose. Forsaking the poor bold the dead clay, another Lyubhima Satyavan arose, starting upright from the incrementer, as if someone over viewless border stepped, emerging on the edge of unseen world. In the earth's day, the silent marvel stood. Earth's day, that is noon time, silent marvel, that is Satyavan. It is he now who is standing, that luminous Satyavan, standing between the mortal woman and the God. Such seemed he as he one departed came wearing the light of a celestial shade, splendidly alien to the mortal air. What can mortal air do that? What can offer to us? He has come as if from some other sky, from some other splendid world, you see. Such seemed he, as if one departed came, wearing the light of a celestial stream. The mind sought things long loved and fell back foil from unfamiliar hues. So you can't imagine it. Mind falls silent, you see. Behave yet long by the sweet, radiant form. So that is the description of now this living Satyavan. You see how the poet elaborates every aspect of it. He doesn't simply make a phrase and go away. By the sweet, radiant form, unsatisfied, incredulous, unbelievable, of his two bright hints of heaven. You cannot imagine how beautiful he is, you see, out of heaven. Too strange, the brilliant phantasm of life's clown, desiring the warm creations of the earth, rare the aja of material sun. The senses seize in vain the glorious shade. Only the spirit knew the spirit still. And a heart divine, the old loved heart, though changed. So this is how 
Savitri is being, Savitri is saying, this is how Yama is saying, this luminous Satyavan is seen. Only the spirit, Dev the spirit still. And the heart divine, the old, loved heart, Savitri, that is Savitri, those change. Between two realms he stood, he is on earth, he is up there. Between these two he is standing now, not wavering, but fixed in quiet, strong expectancy. He is there now, now something has to happen, he is waiting for the order. Yes, what do we have to do now? Here is Savitri, here is Yama, the spirit of Satyavan is in between them at this moment, at this time. But fixed in quiet, strong expectancy, like one who sightless listens for a command. He is not seeing anything at all, he can't see. But he is waiting for the command. Yes, what do I do now? 